How are you guys doing? I, I recently had a video about when to take CPAP and OAS that, that got a lot more views than most of my videos get. Most of my videos get like 12 or 13 views by my mom or whatever. But it was very nice to see. Thank you guys very much for watching and subscribing. And if you haven't already, please hit that subscribe button. But something that happened when that video came out was that I realized, well, for one, I can make mistakes, but also that a lot of Canadians are still really unclear about why they get what they get from the pension plans that we have in Canada. And so today I want to talk about our three pension plans and how they work and why you get what you get. So in Canada, we have three different pension plans. We have old age security, we have CPP and we have GIS. And I'm gonna talk about them all three in detail. Uh, I'm not gonna get into every little nitty gritty detail about how they all work and all the little nuances because that would take me forever to talk about. And I'm going to assume that we're talking about somebody that is a Canadian resident and these aren't following like expat rules because some of that stuff gets really confusing. Uh, so we'll just go into, you know, an individual and why it works like that. And first we'll start off with the easiest one. This is one that every single Canadian gets no matter what, uh, which is old age security. And it's a very simple pension plan where basically if you are a Canadian, then you are going to get some old age security at the age of 65 or older. And the only requirement that you have to have in order to get old age security is that you've had to have lived in Canada for at least 10 years since the age of 18 until you were 65. In order to get full old age security, then you have to have lived in Canada for 40 years between that stretch of 47 years. So you could have lived outside of Canada for seven years during that time and still receive old age security. Now, if you've lived in Canada for only 10 of the years, then you're not going to get full old age security. I'll talk about the calculation in a second. So it's very simple. If you've lived in Canada for the full 40 years of the requirement, then you turn 65, you apply for OAS, you're entitled to get 615.37 per month for the rest of your life, which is indexed to inflation. Uh, all of this is completely taxable. A lot of people get mad at me and say it's not indexed to inflation, but it is. Uh, last year, old age security was paying $608 a month. Is it going up perfectly with inflation? Probably not, but I don't make these things up. Now, how the calculation works is, say you've lived in Canada for 10 years, and then, so it's going to be 10 divided by 40, or however many years you've lived, divided by 40, which equals, in this case, 25%, you're going to be entitled to 25% of OAS. So in this case, that's 153.84 per month. Now, the earliest that you can take OAS is at the age of 65. Doesn't mean you need to take it at 65. Doesn't necessarily mean that you should take it at 65, but you can take it at 65. And you can delay, if you want, until the age of 70. And every month that you delay, you're going to get a 0.6% increase in OAS for all of those months. So you can have a 36% increase if you wait until you're 70 years old. And in some cases, this is actually going to make sense. So one in particular, and first I guess I should talk about OAS clawback before I explain this. But almost everybody knows that OAS gets clawed back if you make too much money in retirement. Almost everybody knows about this and worries about this, but this is something that affects the top 3% of Canadian income earners and all 100% of OAS uh, people that receive it are worried about it for some reason. But basically it's just saying the government says, guess what, if you make too much money, 
we're not going to give you old age security because we don't necessarily think that you need it. Uh, that's their decision. Now, where it starts is if you make over $79,845, then your OAS is going to start getting clawed back. It's going to start getting reduced for every dollar that you make above that uh, beginning threshold. And if you make over $129,075, your OAS is going to be completely clawed back. You're not going to get any of it. So there are some retirement planning strategies you need to think about with this. But one thing that I absolutely hate to see, and I've seen this on multiple occasions, is before you turn 65, the government, the CRA, is going to send you a letter that's saying you can apply for OAS. Obviously, you're like, nice, a free $600 a month, but you're still working when you're 66 years old, and you're making over $130,000 a year, so you don't get any of your OAS, all of it gets clawed back, and you don't get to get the enhanced amount of 0.6% per month that you delay. So I absolutely hate to see that. Please don't do that if that's the case for you. Now, another thing that we need to think about with OAS is if you're going to retire but you worked and made good money above the OAS clawback threshold the year before because the government, I mean, claims that they know how to do a whole bunch of things and predict the future and do all these special things, but one thing that they can't do is predict the future. So what they're basing your income on is what you made in the previous year. So let's just say, for example's sake, that you were going to retire on your 65th birthday, which is January 1st of you know next year, and you wanted to take OAS on January 1st. But in the year previous, you made $200,000. So then you apply for OAS, and you don't get it because the government thinks that they're supposed to claw it all back. And because they don't know this, you can eventually get the OAS money back, but obviously you're going to have to deal with somebody that works in some office that has no idea what's going on. So you can preemptively plan for this by filling out a form, which is the T1213 uh, OAS form, and say, look, I'm not going to make that much money, give me my GD OAS next year. So that's OAS. Now let's talk about CPP, which is easily the most complex pension plan that we have in Canada, which makes it the most misunderstood, which then makes it, you know, post on Facebook go super viral where some guy makes up a bunch of stupid numbers about how o o CPP works, and they're all false and like a hundred thousand people share this thing. Drives me absolutely crazy. But, okay, so OAS is funded by general, general revenues from the government, you know, which is just a fancy way of saying taxpayer dollars, but CPP is funded by employees and employers, but is at the end of the day just an extra tax that we have to pay. Well, CPP is kind of a piss off for people that are really good at saving their own money because they know that they could go right ahead and say, you know, I wish that I could invest that for myself because I'd have more control. I wouldn't lose it if I pass away early. All of these things that, you know, stress people out about CPP. But I wouldn't get too overly worked up about it because I'm going to talk about it when I explain GIS. And if we didn't do this, because essentially this is just a tax they're making us pay, then all of a sudden we just have to increase our taxes to pay GIS to everybody. So basically, I guess we'll just deal with the fact that CPP is a thing and I will explain it. Now. When it was set up, originally it was said, okay, we want CPP to replace 25% of, you know, a Canadian's income for their retirement. The rest can come from old age security and their own, you know, savings or pension plans or whatever else on top of that. But 
There's the thing called the CPP enhancement that's coming into play right now. I've done some videos on it where they're trying to replace one third of our income instead of 25%, which means us and our employers have to pay more into it. If you're your own employer, then you have to pay into it twice. So for example, for me, I have to pay for Kent, like as K4, and then as Kent, I have to put in to my CPP every year. Um, so now the other thing is that the government obviously doesn't want to replace a quarter of a third of somebody's income that makes $500,000 a year. There are limits to you know how much they're going to pay out in CPP. So that's where we come up with a number that is, is based on something called YMPE, or the Yearly Maximum Pensionable Earnings. And in 2021, 20, that number is $61,600. So this goes up every year with inflation. Last year it was 59 or something like that. Uh, there's another number that we need to know about, which is called the Basic Annual Amount, which is 3500 hasn't changed for as long as I can remember. And it means that if you make 3500 or less, you and your employer do not have to contribute to CPP on your behalf. But on everything that is in between 3500 and 61,600, you and your employer have to pay a percentage of your income towards CPP. And in 2021, that number is 5.45%, which is going up over time due to the CPP enhancement. Works out to a contribution of 3,166.45 each, or annually 6,332.90. So that is if you make at least 61,600 then you have fully maxed out your CPP for that year. But let's say, for example, that you make exactly half of YMPE, and that's how much you pay into it, then you are only going to be entitled to half of the CPP benefit because you've only contributed 50%. And so it's really hard when people ask me, they're like, Ken, how much is my CPP going to be? And I'm like, well... Can you show me every single year of your earnings compared to what YMPE is? And then, yeah, maybe I can calculate it, but that's really hard. Might be easier for you just to go on the CRA website and see what the estimate is for what you think you're going to be able to receive. Now, there's a couple other things that we need to note about CPP. And the first one is that the government understands that you're probably not just going to turn 18, start kicking ass, start working your entire career till you're 65, and always max out CPP, and then be entitled to full CPP. So they give you a little bit of a break here, and they say, look, we understand that you know some of the years or months or whatever, you're probably not going to earn that much money. So we're going to take off your worst 17% of earnings. And that basically equates to your worst eight years of earnings that you can peel off. Um, now another thing that they do for mothers especially, but I guess primary caregivers, is they say, we understand that you're just not going to pop out a baby and get right back into the workforce. You're allowed to take some time off, but still be entitled to CPP. So what they do is they say, okay, every time you have a baby, you can take off the next seven years after the birth of that baby. So just a really hot tip right here that I thought of was super awesome. If you're a woman, you're 18, you can have a baby at 18, then you can have another baby at 25, then you can have another baby at 32, then you can have another baby at 39, and then you can take off your worst, you know, eight earning years. So you can work from 46 to 57 and get full CPP, which is super sweet. So just a sweet thought. If you want to try it, let me know how it works out. Um, okay, so that's how you fund CPP. That's how the money goes in. That's basically how you can understand why your number is what it is. Now, CPP you can take at any point in between the ages of 60 and 70. 
but the main number that they're always shooting for is 65. That's what your number is based off of. So right now, if you fully maxed out CPP minus the eight years, your benefit would be 1,203.75 a month. This is also fully taxable income and goes up with inflation, just like old age security does. The average CPP benefit today is 689.17 meaning a lot of people didn't fully fund their CPP. So even for me, for example, in years where I just paid myself dividends or you know, didn't have enough income coming in to pay myself a good salary, well, yes, I didn't fully pay into CPP, so I will not be entitled to max CPP. And a lot of business owners don't even pay themselves a salary, so better be good at saving inside of their company to create that income. Um, now, if you take CPP early, then it is going to be reduced by 0.6% a month. So a 36% reduction if you take it at 60 years old. And if you want to delay, you delay any months after 65 years old, it's going to go up by 0.7% per month. So 42% increase if you take it at 70 years old. So max CPP at 60 is 770.40 a month. At 65, it's 1203.75. And at 70, it's 1709.33 a month. So it's a pretty big difference. That's an extra 500 bucks a month if you wait until 70. Some people can't, of course. Uh, as is the case with every pension, this is a lot of people on the other video were like, take it as soon as you can which is not very good advice for everybody, is that if you pass away, that you are, your family is just not going to get all the money that you put into CPP. However, if you have a spouse and they're entitled to survivor's benefits because they need to get their CPP topped up by yours, then they are going to get some portion of your CPP for the rest of their life. So I did a video on survivor's uh, benefits and then the government is like, you know, you paid into CPP your whole life. Like, this is really nice. We're going to be super generous. If you pass away, we're going to give your family 2500 bucks as a death benefit so they can put out like a sweet sandwich tray and like a coffee station at your service that you can't afford. So that's really helpful. Um, now... I was just thinking about this and, and when I run retirement numbers for people all the time and I don't talk about this in videos very often but let's now talk about how like almost easy it is for a couple that both work their whole careers even if they didn't save that much money to retire because of full CPP and OAS because if we add that up if they're entitled to max CPP and OAS at 65 years old, that's $1,800 a month each. So they have over $3,600 a month coming in just from the government pension plans, which is barely going to be taxable because their income's not very high. So that's pretty good money. So that's why it always kind of stresses me out when you see these posts where people are like, you know, the average Canadian needs $1.7 million to retire. And you're like, why do they need that much when they're only spending like five grand or $4,500 a month and they've got $3,600 in guaranteed income for life? Like, so I'm going to do a video explaining some numbers where people can actually get a better idea of what you truly do need to retire. So a lot of people have way more than they need based on their spending habits. So, anyway, last thing I want to talk about CPP really quick is how it is invested. And Justin Trudeau does not invest this money on our behalf. He doesn't have access to it. CPP is invested by an investment board that is separate from the, from the government. They don't take orders from the government. This isn't a piggy bank for the government. This board invests the money on the behalf of Canadians, and they do a really good job of it. So, yes, they do invest in some companies in China, but they're not giving our CPP to China. They're investing in companies in China that they think are going to make money. 
and there was concerns that CPP was maybe going to run out of money at some point in time. And so this rumor is still circulating, but the last real report that was done shows that CPP is well funded for at least the next 90 years. So considering some big catastrophic event, that's where CPP is sitting right now. All right, lastly, let's quickly talk about GIS or the Guaranteed Income Supplement, which is going to top up anybody that does not receive CPP in retirement. So anybody that is receiving CPP is obviously going to be very upset with people that are receiving GIS because they say, I've paid into CPP my entire career, and now this person that didn't is getting the exact same amount of money as me and I understand why that upsets you but at the same time if basically we just think about CPP as a tax that we have to pay and our employers have to pay and not as like some pension that we paid into but just a tax that the government makes us think is special for us then if you think about it like that that's actually what's happening it's not actually a pension plan, more so as like a tax that they're just adding on and then claiming as a pension. So, every Canadian gets OAS, but not every Canadian gets CPP because not every Canadian necessarily works, right? They obviously, not everybody works for whatever reason. Maybe they can't because they're disabled. Maybe they were lazy. Maybe they, uh, Maybe they were working parents or, or, or stayed at home with their kids or whatever, or maybe whoever, who knows? Mental health, maybe they couldn't find a job or you know could only find gainful employment for a certain amount of time, so they only receive a little bit of CPP. And this obviously happens to a lot of Canadians because there are over four million seniors in Canada right now that are receiving some form or another of GIS. So how does GIS work? So it says, as long as you are receiving old age security, so you're at least 65 and you've now applied for old age security, and you don't have an income above a certain threshold, well then you are going to get some amount of GIS. And uh, in this case, GIS basically wants to top you up to $1,534.49 per month. Now OAS is completely taxable, but GIS is not. So if you're only making, you know, $600 a month from old age security, so seven grand a year or whatever, then you're not going to owe any tax because you don't make enough taxable income on paper. Um, now any amount that you make over OAS, so any income you make, let's say you make $100 a month from CPP, that is going to reduce the amount of GIS you get. There's like a calculation that works that says for every dollar you make above this, that's taxable income, then we are going to reduce your GIS. And if you make above $18,648 in taxable income in a year, you are no longer entitled to any GIS. So basically the formula is set that it's trying to make sure that every Canadian gets the exact amount of money as each other in retirement and then everything else that they want to live on has to come from their own personal savings. So if you're single you don't get any CPP then you'll get 615.37 from OAS and 919.12 per month from GIS. They say, well, that's less than full CPP. Yes, it is, but CPP is fully taxable and GIS is not. Maybe you get a tiny bit more from full CPP. I'm not totally sure, depends which province you live in, but roughly they're gonna work out to the same amount. Now, if you're married, you're not gonna get full GIS if you're both receiving full OAS because the government thinks, well, I don't think you need as much money to live, so we're going to give you 553.28 GIS each. 
if one spell doesn't receive OAS, then the other spells can receive full GIS. I think maybe some more or something like that. And lastly, I'll just end with a quick little tip or trick. Don't tell the CRA I told you about this. But let's just think about this for a second. And it seems like a pretty good idea to me. So basically you say, okay, well I'm going to get OAS and CPP. I'm going to get full CPP and I'm going to retire at 65. But, you know, maybe what I should do is I should say, I'm going to take OAS at 65 but not CPP and I'm going to get full GIS until, you know, I'm after 70 years old. And then I'm going to get a 42% increase in my CPP payments for life because I have delayed for so long so that you can sort of do that. And if you need an income top up without reducing your GIS, then you can take some money from your tax free savings account if you've got one or just any money that's sitting in cash that's not earning any interest in the bank because right now interest rates are so low. So, just a quick little tip or trick that I thought I'd share with you. Um, other than that, uh, obviously, please reach out if you've got any questions. or We love comments, obviously, if you've got questions. Uh, thank you guys so much for watching. If you haven't already, please subscribe. Uh, there's a link below for a Patreon. I know, I mean, if you know what that is, it means you can just... Uh, donate any money to us and our channel for uh, supporting us for saying you know what I learned a lot from you thank you very much Kenton everything any dollar is obviously very appreciated so if you can spare anything we'd absolutely love it because I mean we'd be super thankful and we're happy to teach and, and keep plugging along on our little mission so thank you guys again if you want to talk to me personally, you can visit the website, k4financial.ca. I'd be happy to set up a consultation with you or potentially talk to you about our financial planning services. So thank you guys very much, and we'll see you again real soon.